welcome everyone to the general uh, development special interest group. Today is December 10th uh, and we, uh, as usual, have like a set of cool demos and talks uh, and the usual updates. Today, the host is slightly different. So I'm Bert Jensen, for the folks that don't know me, uh, I'm replacing Vesa today. On the agenda, we have the usual update uh, on, on open source initiatives uh, and the demos. So we have three demos today. Uh, Chris Kent is back uh, with some list formatting magic. Um, quite interested to see what the horses came up with after Thanksgiving. Um, sounds like a, a good combination. Horses, Thanksgiving, turkey, I don't know. I leave it up to Chris to come up with something magical there. Sebastian Liver, Sepp, I think probably that's easiest to say Sepp. Um, is doing a demo on getting started building a Teams app with the Microsoft Teams toolkit and, and the Graph toolkit. So combining those two toolkits to build some cool Teams applications. And then we have a set of speakers, uh, Emily, Simon, two Simons, uh, and Sadie, uh, talking about the Microsoft 365 maturity model. It's actually a little bit of a surprise for me as well what that will be. So I'm quite interested to kind of learn what it will be from you guys. So first of all, this is a community and the community is there for you to participate. So how can you participate in this community? Different ways for you to do so. Um, you can demo a piece of code that you wrote, a solution that you wrote, a particular pattern that you used. Uh, it doesn't even have to be open source. You can just show and, and demo what you did for a customer and, and kind of, as long as you talk about the patterns, that's great. Contribute on GitHub. We have several open source repositories um, and we'll list them in a second, uh, but contributing can be ranging from like, Adding a new feature to just fixing, fixing some typos. So any contribution is great. So if you contribute, thanks for that. And obviously also feedback, uh, meaning uh, we do things, we ship things, we create software in the open source community. Sometimes things are good, sometimes things are bad. And if there's things bad, let us know. We need your feedback to, to make things better and to improve. So what are our assets, our uh, open source um, tools that you can use? So we have, uh, ak.ms slash m365 dev YouTube, which is, the, which is the official Microsoft 365 developer videos uh, YouTube channel. So this will contain really focused developer videos, whereas the other YouTube channel, our PNP YouTube channel, uh, ak.ms slash m365 PNP dash videos, is more focused on, on uh, development as well, obviously, but also on other things uh, in the PNP world, like the PNP Weekly, for example, is there. Uh, uh, there's information around for makers and so on. So it's because it's a bit broader than just pure development. Then we have our open source uh, GitHub repositories. They're spread across different organizations in GitHub. So we have the SharePoint org, uh, the BNP org, the Office Dev org, and the Microsoft Graph org. And all of them contain like a ton of repositories with uh, uh, several open source uh, projects and examples. So uh, there's like a massive amount of source <laughs> code to find over there and, and things to contribute and to, to work with. We have sample galleries um, for web parse extensions, list formatting, and themes. Um, so if you want to kind of find a cool sample to start from, uh, go check it out. No point in reinventing the wheel and doing everything from scratch. There probably already is like a sample that does what you want to do in, in a like maybe 80%, but that's already a quite good head start. Or you want to learn a new technology, you want to learn a new approach, use the samples to kind of get started. And the easiest way to remember all of this, what I just mentioned, is the one address that you have to remember if you leave this call. That's ak.ms-m365pnp. That will bring you to our PNP landing page. We'll give you like a nice overview of everything that is available. So um, I think is David uh, Nicole. David, do you want to take uh, this one? Yeah, what thanks, Bert. So the uh learn together event is next wednesday this is a two-hour live stream as you see by developers for developers on developing apps for microsoft teams so you can go register for it at aka.ms learn together it's going to be a live stream but we're also hosting a number of watch parties across the community and the pnp team is going to be hosting one as well uh, you can get the invite for that at aka.ms forward slash pnp watch party and this will provide you uh, the ICS, which you can get into your calendar. It's a full two hours. We're going to actually open the call up a half an hour before. 
leave it open a half an hour after, uh, and you can come in. We'll we'll collaborate a little bit before, and then we'll also have some of our own prizes, so some Parker's Place stuff, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Even if you can only come in for a little bit during that two hours, that's okay. If you want to hang out with us for the full two hours, that's awesome as well. Uh, so go to aka.ms, PNP Watch Party, and we'll have a lot of fun during this two-hour live stream. Nice, nice. And uh, definitely prizes. We have prizes. 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 We also have a, a team sample gallery. Uh, but the, the ak.ms slash teams dash samples address is the place where you can kind of go find those cool teams Totally, samples. totally, yeah. And, and we're looking for new contributions all the time. And the cool thing here, I guess I'll point that out, is that this includes both the Microsoft samples, which are in a few different places, as well as the PNP community samples. So if you're looking for a specific something to get started, um, start here and uh, see see what's out, what's available out there. Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. David, I think this is your usual section, how to get yes. started. Absolutely. Thanks again. All right. So for those that are unaware, the Patterns and Practices community is inclusive and open source, which means that we invite contributions of all areas of our resources and tools. But we also understand that not only contributing, but also using some of these resources and tools can come with some intimidating barriers, for example, around the use of GitHub or understanding the contribution landscape. So Hugo Bernie and I lead the Sharing is Caring initiative, which provides hands-on, step-by-step Step guidance in live smaller group sessions. So there's a number of uh, times and dates available. They range the spectrum from first time contributor to community docs to PNP SPFX samples, uh, as well as the new session SPFX developer workstation setup. In January, we're also going to begin some thematic AMAs, which is going to be a lot of uh, fun and very exciting. So we're going to have members from the different uh, initiatives within PNP, such as community docs or the uh, reusable components and property controls there for you to ask questions, the CLI, PNP, JS, et cetera. So it's a great opportunity to collaborate and get some of those questions on a specific initiative answered if you'd like to ask them, and then we'll open it up for the wide spectrum as well. So you can register for these completely safe spaces. Uh, free of charge, aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring. Uh, we'd like to see it. One, Bert, back to you. Yep. Thank you, David. Great initiative. Uh, it really helps folks to kind of onboard the, into our communities. Now, uh, the usual update on the pnp.net libraries, uh, what's going on in the .NET space. So one thing to celebrate is that we shipped uh, beta one from the PNP Core SDK. So our first beta release of this new uh, library and key new things in this one are .NET 5 support. Uh, so the NuGet package has a .NET 5 compiled uh, version next to a .NET uh, 2.0 standard version. We have a modern page API. So if you want to work with modern pages, uh, we fully cover that one. And we actually have some additional improvements around pages in the pipeline. And for this one, we spend a lot of time on building a uh, proper support for uh, creating all the fields, uh, including the, the more uh, special ones like taxonomy, uh, for example, or lookup fields, and also giving you an easy support to work with them. So essentially, uh, it's a bit based on CSOM, but it's even better, I think. So it's like it gives you like an intuitive, easy way to work with, with fields and list items. Uh, and we're doing more uh, going forward with, with this one. Um, so here you see our kind of master scheme, the plan that we worked on that kind of to get to evolve from the older .NET libraries to the new one. Uh, so PNP framework is the, the PNP site score, so the old library, but then in the new version, uh, standard 2.0 and .NET 5. Um, and our PNP course SDK is the really brand new code base that we created uh, just from scratch. Um, and both are evolving. Uh, and next step that you will see us doing is kind of combine them. So you will see that the PNP framework will consume code from PNP Core SDK, which will give us a way to slowly replace PNP framework code with the newly written code in PNP Core SDK. So that will go forward. So next big milestone will be end of January uh, when we uh, do a GA release of, of all of this. If you look into a bit more detail of what happened uh, for the PNP uh, framework, PNP site score site. So for PNP site score, the old library, we did a new release. That, so the December release is out. This will be the last one. Um, so there will be no new anymore, no new release. For PNP Framework, um, there was a, a really cool uh, PR from uh, Kevin McDonald that actually allows you to take a 
provisioning template and extract it as an MD documentation. So if you want to document your uh, PNP templates, then this gives you like a, just a, a simple uh, commandlet. You run it and boom, you have nice MD format to documentation. Sebastian also did some uh, fixes in the authentication libraries, uh, and there's various other small uh, fixes in code cleanup happening. For PNP Core SDK, uh, I already mentioned uh, the beta one release, and then going forward, our focus now will be on, on craftsmanship. We want to make things as good as possible, fully documented for, for GA. So instead of adding more and more features, we want to focus on quality and, and get to uh, a really high quality library, well documented going for, uh, for the GA timeframe in uh, end of January, um, that will be. Good, uh, PNP PowerShell. So for PowerShell, what did we do there? Main thing is now that uh, for the, the new PowerShell, the cross-platform PowerShell, so this left column over here, uh, it runs in PowerShell 5, PowerShell 7, uh, Azure Cloud Shell, and then Azure Functions. So everywhere, essentially. So which is, is really useful. So you can finally uh, use Azure Functions, write your script in there, and then just run it. And then another thing to highlight is this: uh, the minus use web plugin is back. So we dropped that, uh, but uh, due to a um, large uh, demand from community uh, and also actual usage of this feature, telemetry showed this was really heavily used, we did bring it back. Uh, there are some caveats on the usage, so if you try it out, you will see some warnings, uh, but it's back. And then uh, for the classic uh, PNP PowerShell, the old one, um, uh, and this is actually also, this also applies to the PNP Sites Core. We kind of lock down the repositories, so you can still create issues, but if you create a PR, it will be automatically closed because we want you to move to a PNP framework uh, and to the new PowerShell repositories. Victor, I think I saw you on a call. Can you do a quick update on, on your teams? Yes, I'm here. So I'm super glad that uh, Microsoft Teams JavaScript SDK. So as you can see in the screenshot here, it's only one line essentially to initialize and start working with the, the team's uh, JavaScript SDK, you don't have to do initialize and stuff. It takes care of all that, and you can just verify that you're hosted in Teams and everything is initialized and fine, and then, then code away. So it simplifies the whole um, client-side development quite a lot. Uh, so that was the main feat of this new release. Uh, we had some great discussions in the repo over some uh, build performance. So if you're uh, suffering from build performance, take a look at the, one of the issues there and you see some tips and tricks on how to do that uh, or improve the performance, not, not how to get bad performance. Uh, so that's absolutely something we are uh, trying to align and get into the solution. And thanks to Patrick, we also now, uh, or the PMPJS supports uh, the new uh, ECMAScript modules better. So uh, we are trying to build out some great samples to use PMPJS in combination with the O-Team solutions. And of course, uh, adding all of those new features coming in the schema 1.8 and also the new dev pre preview schema, there's quite a few missing things in the, in the scaffolding that we're looking into fix. Yep, nice updates, so really good progress again. And then, Beth, I think we have, we have you on a call as well. Seems to be some celebration going on here. Yes. <laughs> um, so we were originally going to release the 2.0 this morning. Um, unfortunately, there's some uh, like docs issues with our partner team, so we are going to push this for one day. Uh, the 2.0 okay. release is going to be out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can still celebrate. We think yes. It's... Looking at the time um, zones, what's one day then? You know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so go to bed uh, expecting tomorrow morning there's going to be a new graph to get out there. So in the in the second version of the or the, in the uh, v2 of Microsoft Graph Toolkit, we are introducing a update to the MGT person card, which looks like the I think SharePoint has some sort of a person card that looks more like a first party experience. So we're, we're bringing that into the toolkit for everybody to use. Uh, if you've been following us, you will see a lot of new, new sections in the person cart now, including files that you share with the person, emails, send a chat, um, a lot of new information from the new person API, um, and just, just go check it out. And then we're also introducing a new MGD to do component, bre breaking that apart from the original MGD tasks for you to get um, to do tasks specifically from the to do app or to do API. Um, we're introducing caching the graph calls so that your front-end network calls is going to be a lot cheaper. 
uh, localization, right to light support, um, dark theme for all the component for you to easily switch by adding only one class. And we're also sp splitting up the packages for people to use um, whatever you need it to be using. Also, new MGT React package for people who build specifically React components or React applications to be able to add MGT components more easily. Uh, a lot more samples, a lot more documentations, so definitely check out the 2.0 version. Uh, we're also going to have two new providers coming out. Both will be contributed by our community. And then you can see a list of everybody who helped us with our 2.0 release. And Sebastian is going to show a sample later in this call, and then he's probably going to show off some of the new features in Graph Toolkit. Yeah. Okay, do. Bob, uh, the Microsoft Teams sample update, you really, really touched upon it briefly in the beginning, but maybe you can give a bit more details now. Yeah, so some great new samples this week. The first one is from Luis Manez, and apologies if I say anybody's name wrong. Um, people have been asking me forever for the ability to send notifications to individual users in Teams. So if your app does something and it wants to let some user know, previously this required a bot mostly to do it, a proactive message, and it was fairly complex. So there's a new graph API that fixes that, and Louise has an excellent sample here, which shows how to build that into a Teams tab so that when one user does something on a tab, perhaps uh, many users are getting notified. Really cool. Also, tab single sign-on has been out now for a few weeks, and it's really hot. So we have two new tab SSO samples. Abtin and Arun uh, did one with MVC, and full, it's a full MVC app that does all of the server side of SSO in a web API. And then Hilton has kind of a double two-in-one with MVC and Node.js backends for a React front end. So both really great examples if you're interested in tab SSO. And they're all available at that same, that same URL. Ikidotemis slash teams dash samples. You Thank bet. You, so thanks, everybody, and then keep them coming. All right. Now, let's do a quick picture time, because we're running, running slightly late already. So let me see if I can do that as well. So we need. I can do it if you want, Bert. Yeah, if you can do it, it I, I don't. It, act, it actually works here. All right. Smile, wave. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks. Um, so let me share again. Actually, uh, yeah. <laughs> Move to our first demo, which is Chris, if I'm not mistaken. Chris, are you ready? All right, everybody. Hello, I'm Chris. Let's talk about some formatted stuff. All right. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Power Automate and some of the ways we can make that uh, work a little better with Flow. We've done that a number of times. All right. With uh, list formatting, we've done that a number of times where we customize the button, we customize the panel. We'll show you both today. Uh, but we're going to focus in on a little trick you can use with Power Automate and then how you can tie all that together nicely with list formatting. So first off, we head over to our classic Warrior Horses site that we all have. And now the Warrior Horses, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, they're at battles, they're, they're murdering and killing and mayhem and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, they're no stranger to bureaucracy, right? So they've got their own set of approvals and everything else. So even in the midst of battle, they need to submit their battle plans for approval. So they've got this nice battle plans list because generally when you're in battle, right, you've got the, the SharePoint app or the, you know, some way to access SharePoint. So, of course, that's what they're doing here. So we've got our battle plans list. Come on over here. And here you see we've got a couple of battle plans. We'll zoom in slightly here. Right, and so what they can do is they can request that approval. So what we've done is we've attached a flow to this list. And again, we've talked about that in previous uh, videos. We'll link to those later. Uh, and we've created a button that'll launch those. I'm gonna show off this format and then we're gonna talk about how we created all this. All right, so we've got a button, when we hit request, all right, we'll see that uh, it comes over here. It's gonna launch that flow panel. All right, so we've got our customized uh, title here, customized button, that's great. We're ready to get, we're ready to have our battle pan approved. We're going to hit nay. It's going to go off. It's going to run in kind of the background and it's going to start an approval process. Right now, a lot of times when you've got these approval processes, right, it would be very helpful to communicate that status. Right. So we've got things like an actual status field. Right. But then we also have this kind of approval field. 
Now, what we're going to see here is end users sometimes want to know exactly where things are, right? Who they need to go bug, uh, what's happening, you know, how close are they? Especially these guys, they're literally on a battlefield waiting for approval to launch their bombs, right? So we got this nice uh, view here. So when you hover over it, right, we can actually see, you know, kind of an outline, a little Visio type diagram of where we are in the process. You can see we're at gate one, right? And we can find out what's going on there. Now, if we take a look, uh, here, we also have this nice flow run details. Let's come back to that in just a moment. So if we take a look uh, over here at my mail, right, we should have a mail here. So we've got a nice approval, right? It comes in and says, you know, the details here. We're going to go ahead and approve that. And we're just going to submit that. So we'll get that approved. And you notice that I didn't refresh the list. I didn't do anything else. So if we come back uh, to our list, right, it said pending gate one. Here in a moment, it should say pending gate two. Uh, once that approval gets recognized, um, and the nice thing is, again, we can just kind of keep this up. There it is, pending gate two. If I hover over this, right, we should see now we're at gate two, right? You can see that nice yellow. And that's really cool, right? So as an end user, I can find out exactly how close I am to uh, launching my battle plan or if I've been denied or not. Now, one of the things we've got here is, and that's great, right? But what if I'm trying to troubleshoot this flow, right? It's stuck on gate two for whatever reason. I mean, flows are the easiest things in the world to create, right? Right? Never any problems. Uh, so sometimes we want to troubleshoot things. Now, in the past, when we've got uh, SharePoint style workflows, right? You can uh, you can go to a list item. You can go see all the associated workflows with that item, and then you can go right in there. Uh, flow doesn't really offer us that, right? So we can go to flow, or you can see we've got this flow here. And we fresh that. We'll see our runs down here, uh, which should just be the a couple of them here, right? So now we can see it's running. Now we can guess because we just have the one running which entry this is, right, based on the time. Uh, but generally, when you're doing this, you're going to have, you know, tons of these, right? Uh, and it's hard to find out which one applies to which specific list item, right? Now we have to know it's this one, but what if we had a way to link to that directly from the item? That's what this flow run details is. You can see I've got a little note here, requires flow ownership rights to access. But if I click that, it's going to open up a new window. It's going to actually go directly to the run for that flow. All right, so we can see the flow is running, and we can actually see, uh, you know, it's gate one approved, and we come down here, gate two approvals, where it's sitting. All right, so we can see that. Now, obviously, this is a lot harder to understand than our nice uh, diagram here, which is, again, why we've done this. Uh, but we're allowing you to jump right into that flow run. So how did we do that? Well, let's take a look at our actual flow uh, and one key portion to do that. All right, so let's just hit edit so we can see this flow. The key here, and I've, I've pulled this from some blog some time ago, some long time ago, and I apologize, I don't remember uh, where I got it. Uh, but the idea is here, I create this variable. Right, I use this initialize uh, variable action, and I'm just going to set this expression. Now, this is going to be tough to read. Let's see if we can pull it up. We'll show it a little more detail here in a few minutes. Actually, let's just jump to that so we can see it a little better. Here it is. All right, so the idea is we're just concatenating several strings together, all right? So we're pulling out, you know, we're building a URL to the flow run, all right? So we've just got our standard guy here. Then we're pulling out from the actual workflow itself the environment name we're running in. Then we're just throwing on this, you know, slash flow slash, getting the workflow name, slash run slash, and then we're actually getting the instance here, all right? So all of this builds a URL that links directly to the run of the flow we're on, all right? So you can copy and paste this uh, multiple times uh, to any number of flows, and it'll just take care of things for you. So what I'm doing then, or right, is we're actually updating the item to set that status, right? We want to set it to pending gate one. And we've got this approval field. It's just a single line of text, and we're just throwing that flow URL in there. Okay? So that's what we're doing there to kind of save that, to give us that quick jump right back into it. So now if we take a look here. So how are we using that, right? So if we take a look at this format... You know, we'll scroll over if we can keep it in mind. Uh, by the way, I don't know if anyone has noticed uh, they're now supporting this. This is not the extension that's doing this, right? So this is just native out of the box. I'm getting uh, some IntelliSense, um, everything right here in this box. It's no longer just a plain text box, so that's awesome, right? It's actually using uh, mono, whatever it is, the VS Code stuff. So if we come down here, we've got the execute flow, right? So this is only happening when it, it's not started, so we get that button. And you can see where we're setting that header text, and we're doing the run flow button text, and we've got the ID of our flow, and that's what triggers that flow panel. Uh, but after it started running, we don't want to show that anymore, so we no longer do that. And we just do that with a simple, uh, where's the style, 
display, right? If the status is not started, then, you know, put it as none. Don't show it. And then down here, man, can we make this box any bigger? Let's see if we can. There we go. Slightly bigger. Uh, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Nice thing is you've got these nice collapsible sections now. Again, all out of the box now. All right, so now we've got ourselves a div here where we're pulling everything. And the key portion is this giant thing way down here, which is a giant SVG object. All right, and what I did was I just created this in Inkscape, and then I copied those paths out. Um, and then all I'm doing is I'm checking for certain ones of those squares right here. If the status is pending gate 2, then make it yellow. Otherwise, make it gray. And you can see that's exactly what's happening here. And then the final piece there is that uh, run flow flow run details, which we scroll way down here, right past all that SVG fun. Uh, we can see right here it's just a link, and it's being set to the current field because this is the single text field that I wanted to use for that. So that's just that flow URL we built inside our flow. And we set it here, and we're just making a link out of it. And that's all there is to that. Uh, obviously, there's a Quite a bit of complication in doing some of this, uh, but it's a great way to provide both uh, a status to your end users, right? So the horses that are on the field want to know what's happening, uh, but also if you want to troubleshoot or find that specific flow run later, you can jump over to that. All right, so let's take a quick review on that. So again, here's this. Uh, check the uh, recording to get this a little better. We'll also publish that somewhere. And then over here, so the key here with this display progress Right, is to keep in mind that flow URL. Don't just have it there because there's no way to security trim your format, unfortunately, right now, uh, which is why I put that little lock icon and put a, a note there because regular users are going to get an error when they try and go that if they don't have ownership rights on that flow. Now, if you've set that as part of the uh, list, right, so you have the list owning it and they've got permission on that list, then you should be good to go. All right, then that custom flow chart, you can use Visio. So I'll say it's possible, sort of. I ran into a lot of trouble with that. Uh, but you can save a Visio as an SVG uh, format. Unfortunately, a lot of it is using uh, features that are not supported uh, directly by uh, list formatting. List formatting really only supports paths. So in your SVG, it's not going to support rectangles, circles, uh, certain transforms, you know, uh, certain styles such as, you know, line line endings and caps and stroke widths and things like that. So there's a lot of massaging of that you're going to have to do. And so at some point, it's easier just to get an open source thing like Inkscape and just draw it, right? So you can see I've just drawn it here. I just use gray, and then I change those fills dynamically. All right. So make sure you check out the full documentation. There's quite a bit more things you can do. Um, I even used uh, one of the newer operations. There's a starts with operation uh, for this. You can check that out in the sample. We've got all of these samples, 100 plus samples, including this one available here. And that's all I've got. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. It's, uh, I was just saying, like, it's not just any more list formatting magic. It's actually list formatting and flow magical almost. So really mm. cool, super, super useful. Uh, why isn't this out of the box type of, of <laughs> feature? <laughs> yeah. Well done. Um, so I think next demo is from Sepp. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, how to build a Teams app using the Microsoft Teams Toolkit and the Graph Toolkit, combining both toolkits to build cool applications. Sepp, take it away. Absolutely. So um, I will go um, quite quickly. I want to make sure that you guys get the uh, get a lot of time for the introduction to the um, uh, Microsoft 365 Metroidy model. I really think it's awesome. So let's go quickly through the slides, and I want to show you a, a working example on how you can get started to build your first Microsoft Teams app using the Microsoft Graph Toolkit, but also the Microsoft Teams Toolkit. So first, I wanted to start with kind of what is the Graph Toolkit for the ones that are new to the toolkit. So the Graph Toolkit is a collection of web components. So here, web components is important, um, which uh, are all powered by the Microsoft Graph. They are not, they are functional components. So you drag them onto your, on any HTML page and automatically magic happens uh, powered by the graph. It's not like uh, you have to bind them to data whatsoever. It's all built into the web components. The components are functional, working uh, automatically with Microsoft Graph, and they work with any web framework. So if you are, today I'm going to do the demo uh, utilizing plain JavaScript and HTML, actually just plain HTML, not even JavaScript. Um, but you can actually make it happen in Vue, in Angular. We have wrappers for React, so it's it's really functional in any type of uh, client-side framework that you would like to use, and it works on all uh, all the modern browsers. 
Um, they're beautiful. They're very flexible. We won't go into that today, but it's it's great because you can actually customize them to uh, really bring your own your own styling in there or your own uh, ways of working with components, and it works just everywhere. Um, there is a bunch of components. Today we will be using the login component, the person, the piece, the person card, uh, the people, the people picker, the agenda and to do. So basically in a seven minute demo, we're going to cover seven of those components quite rapidly. Um, and you're going to see how easy it is to actually bring uh, into this. First, how do you get started? Well, the easiest way to get started with the Microsoft Graph uh, Toolkit is just to use this simple script reference to what we call the MGT loader. The loader will just make sure it loads all the necessary JavaScript file in any HTML page. And then afterwards, the only thing you have to do is to go here and add what we call providers. Because the Microsoft Graph Toolkit is graph powered, we need to give it a little bit of a context of what is the app that we will be using um, and what are some of the uh, redirect URL that we want to use. Also, we want to talk about the scope. So the sample we're going to do today, use today uses a bunch of different permissions on the graph, but here you can really just scope to whatever you want to do inside your app. Once this is done, so once you have your first loader reference and you have the providers that are in there and here uh, notice that we have two providers, one for MSAL, which is the one that will actually do some of the work when you're running as a SPA, the single page application, and one which is Teams that will do some work when you are embedded in Teams. The beauty here is that it understands the context of where you are and will automatically do the right work for you. And afterwards, you just drop in to your HTML, these kind of components. And here you notice it's MGT-login, MGT-agenda, and all of those are basically, now that you loaded MGT, they become magically native components you can use in HTML. So you don't need to have any other framework whatsoever. You can just drop these in any page and magic will happen. So what I suggest is why don't we just go and have a look at a solution that um, we already built earlier that actually runs that. So let me go here, let me close that for now, let me zoom in just a little bit, and let's start with our index.html, which is our page. So basically, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, what I did to create this, I went on Microsoft Teams here, and I hit create a new Teams app. This is the Microsoft Teams toolkit that helps you scaffold an app really, really, really rapidly and will enable you later to also play around with the manifest to install the app in Teams and all these kind of things. So basically, the Teams Toolkit is just kind of a, a um, an, acceler an accelerated way to get your app inside Microsoft Teams. But there's no real magic around the toolkit. You just focus on your code. So let's focus on our, on our code here. So the first thing you're gonna you're gonna see is both of these integrations here. The first one we are adding the Microsoft Teams SDK from its CDN. Why? Because we will need to understand, hey, we are in Teams, so we need to have the JavaScript um, SDK uh, hooked into our page so we know that we are working in Teams. Then afterwards, we will be adding the Microsoft Graph Toolkit in there. Here you see that we're using MGT at next. So basically here we are running on the uh, release candidates of MGT version two, which is very, very close to be, uh, to be shipped, uh, which should be uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, Beth promised it. So let's all hope that she uh, and the team uh, will do it. And if not, we can wait for Monday. Nobody will die if uh, anything happens. But, but the work you've been doing, and I'm going to show it today, is amazing. Why? Because it makes everything so simple. First thing, um, you just have to put in your Teams provider and MSAL provider. These are requesting a client ID, a list of scopes, and in that case, a redirect URL or an auth URL. Teams works with a different approach to authentication, so we need to provide a page just for that. And then, the rest of the page is basically just HTML. Here we, or I'm using here the grid from React, 
from the uh, yeah from uh, the UI fabric uh, or Fluent UI or Nordstar or Stardust, depending on who when when you started to use it. And here you will see all of these different grids, but here's the most important part: MGT login. Very simple. Actually, I could even do this, make it even simpler. Don't need that. MGT login. Then afterwards, MGT agenda. Then afterwards, MGT to do. And then finally, MGT people picker. That's it. You just need to put them on a page. When you're ready, you can go to the terminal and say npm start. It's going to start automatically on your machine a local host that will be used to run this sample. So let me show you quickly. Here I'm going to open this. I can go to local o, local local host 3000. And I want to go to the host page. I'm going to go to here. And now I have an empty page. Why? Because I'm not logged in. So as you can see, we have four components. You see here the sign-in component right there on top of the uh, on left. I just here. Let's go with this. Um, this one is that sign in. I have my agenda that is empty. My tasks are empty and people probably won't work because I'm not connected. I'm just going to sign in. I'm going to say that I am that user. And the first thing you're going to see is a consent screen saying, hey, by the way, you're using an app that will require all of these permissions. So either you say accept or you don't want and you hit cancel and you won't be able to use the app. Or if you're an admin, you can also consent for all the users on behalf of the organization. So basically just the admins would see the screen. Um, depends uh, on what's your, um, what's your approach to uh, consent. I, I, I love to show this screen to everybody so it's, it's clear and transparent. I hit accept. I'm being redirected. And now automatically, I just called the graphic. Look how amazing is this. Here, um, I have all my agenda items that are coming from my uh, calendar, all my tasks, and I can even add some tasks in here. Uh, I can search for people. I can complete tasks. It's going to automatically go to the graph and mark this task as completed. I can search for Megan right from here. And one of the cool things, which is one of the new features that we have in MGT, which is when I hover on Megan, I actually have that. And I will, yes, I want to see all these uh, permissions for this user. I will be to see here all of these things. So who is uh, Megan reporting to? What are the emails I have with her? Um, her contact info, her full uh, org chart here, the emails um, about her, uh, her, all built into the toolkit. You don't have to do anything. Users just need to consent to it. So it's great, but this is not in Teams. If I go to Teams, automatically I go here. Let me make sure I'm not in here so we can actually see the effect. Um, I can go here and click on PNP demo. When I was in Teams, uh, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, in code, I was able to go in here and actually open the Microsoft Graph Toolkit and just say App Studio. It's going to ask me to log in. Give me a second. I'm going to log into the right environment. I'm going to go here. I'll just log in with my account and automatically Visual Studio will be connected to my environment. I should be able to go back here. And now I can actually, and I'm just going to zoom out because it looks like it's not great. And here I was able to go on test and distribute and hit install. So this brought the app right in there. There's no configuration. Everything is done for you. All this app is done by default. All the, the URLs, everything is taken care of uh, by the toolkit, so you don't have to play around. And then when you go back here and you go back to Teams and you open the PNP demo, well, automatically here, what is going to happen is the exact same thing will be happening. So here I have the exact same content where I can see my agenda, my task, and I can again search for Megan. Um, well, with, when I'm not typing the wrong thing. And here I have all of this. So quite easy to bring that super powerful, cap these super powerful capabilities with basically this line of code here, this line of code here, and this line of code here. Um, so I wanted to kind of introduce you to uh, the toolkit like this. With the Microsoft Teams toolkit, it's super easy because you get that page that you need. You just put that in there. 
and you are kind of good to go for this. So a couple of resources for you if you want to learn more about um, some of uh, the things around the Microsoft Graph Toolkit. And Bert, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Seb. Super, super cool demo. I really like the fact that you can combine the, the easiness of the Graph Toolkit with Teams. Uh, also, the people card, that's kind of amazing what it shows. So it's like, like the in-product features, exactly the same almost. So really, really nice. All right, I think this is kind of we're right on schedule for our last demo. Uh, Emily, Simon, uh, two Simons, uh, and Sadie, um, take it away. Well, thank you for uh, inviting us to come and speak and share uh, the maturity model for Microsoft 365. So we're going to introduce you to the maturity model for Microsoft 365, and I want to explain why it's been created. <laughs> so the maturity model provides the why for Microsoft 365. You know, we all love building cool features on the 365 platform, whether it's that list formatting magic or Microsoft Teams apps or the uh, SharePoint framework web parts, you know, you guys have built uh, as part of the PMP. Um, and we can see the value these enhancements provide. How often it's quite difficult for us to get buy-in from key decision makers and, as they don't see the value of the features or they don't see the big picture. So what the maturity model does, and it's aimed at business owners, key decision makers, technical consultants, to enable them to see and understand the benefits and the impact that the 365 platform can have on their business. It's a framework that uh, provides a, uh, a holistic view of the organization and, and, and labels it to understand where it is on its Microsoft 365 journey. And the framework allows decision makers to understand the impacts and benefits that they can get and the organization can get if it focuses energy on improving Microsoft 365. So the framework provides uh, a way of understanding the options which might be available for solving different business problems. Um, it allows them to see where they currently are and, and identify where they want to be, their desired state. So then they can the organization can focus the energy resources on the right things for the business. And finally as well, it enables the business to have a baseline so it can measure how it's doing on its Microsoft 365 journey and see how things are improving over time. And finally, the, the maturity model is part of the 365 community docs efforts and it's part of the PMP sharing is caring initiative. So, you know, we can have community input and uh, your wisdom and expertise can uh, help make it better. So where, you know, how, you know what, what is the maturity model based on? Well, it's based on the capability maturity model, which was built in, uh, it's 1986 actually, uh, and it was designed uh, to improve software development processes model. The level one is sort of the, the start of the process, and it uh, is level one initial, and this is where processes, they're not documented, they're chaotic, they're poorly controlled, and, and they uh, react to the environment that they're within. Um, and then this is the initial initial stage. Uh, level two, uh, which is managed, and this is where we the processes are, are start to becoming documented. Um, but different projects might have different uh, different approaches, different processes, and they're still reacting to to the environment, so that they are still quite chaotic. And then as we move to uh, level three, the defined uh, level, this is where processes are documented and this really takes up a notch. Your process is documented uh, and they're enforced across the organization and these processes have been sort of well thought out and so they are proactive um, and, and, and are not reacting so much to uh, environment changes. So once you've got to level three then the level four is quantitatively managed and this is where we take those documented processes um, which are being constantly applied across the business and we add some measures to them so that we can see how effective they are. And it's interesting to see how even though this was built in 1986, you know, this ability to measure is, is what we use in you know, agile software development today. So once you've got uh, uh, processes which are being measured, then we can sort of move to the holy grail of level five where we can start optimizing processes um, and we can t make tweaks to the process and then uh, measure the effect that it has on, on the organization and on those processes so we can select the tweaks which work best for us so we can improve those processes. 
this slide shows how we've applied the capability maturity model to the Microsoft maturity model or Microsoft 365 maturity model. I'm not going to go through this now because we're a bit short on time, but however, we'll be sharing the presentation and if you're interested, you can take a look. So I'd like to hand it to Mr. Hudson, who's going to discuss the approach we've taken. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, and uh, I'm going to sort of think about the approach that we've taken with building a substantial set of documents already around uh, the capability and maturity model for Microsoft 365. Um, the first thing is if the purpose of developing a maturity model is to enable management buy in, then we deliberately chose not to make this too technical. We're not going to let the competencies that we've developed documentation for be driven by the technology or the features. Yeah. And, and part of that is because the technology platform is just vast and changing so very quickly. Um, but business needs are relatively common and relatively slower. So we've concentrated on defining a set of business competencies that resonate with the Microsoft 365 capabilities but underpin business activity. Um, we want to be able to provide tools, not just information, and we want the organizations, as Simon said, to be able to use those tools to figure out where they are in any function or any department or any part of the business and what better looks like, how they get there. So not only should the maturity model uh, for Microsoft 365 not be about features, but it also shouldn't be about IT. We wanted to create a toolkit which anybody in the business, particularly managers and change agents within the organization, can pick up and run with. So that's the approach that we've taken. Just to touch on a moment of history, all of this really started with the SharePoint material at Sadie, who was on this call, and to whom we're all very grateful for kicking all this off. Um, uh, it all really started with the SharePoint maturity model, and that was really quite focused on the capabilities that SharePoint 10 years ago brought to the table. If we move on to the next slide there, you'll see how we've morphed that into being more business orientated. And look at that, a genuine morph, look at that. Um, so we've got a set of competencies which are very business orientated. We've tried to think about the things which underpin almost any kind of a business. We think we've been pretty encompassing in that, but if you think we've missed anything, please let us know, because uh, we can ask some more. Um, we're not quite finished in the job yet. So there's uh, about three that are currently under development. Those are the ones in the middle. But we haven't stopped there either. We think that this is a, a pretty large undertaking. And so we've started wrapping some additional documents, things like how, how do you have the print? What are the principles of co uh, communication, for example, around that? So there are additional documents looking at uh, supporting concepts tools for moving from level 300 to 400, for example, and uh, practical advice on implementation. So that's what we've been trying to do. Of course, that's lovely, but you still don't know what it is. So let's have a look at one. This is uh, on the left hand side, you see what the full collaboration competency would look like if you had it all out on a very long sheet of paper, like those old lino printers that I uh, grew up with. And then we've pulled out one particular section. So you can see that we've tried to produce something that is rather more digestible. Um, a couple of important principles in there. Um, we've tried to make sure that there is consistency through all of the documents. So we've got the same sets of headings, um, the, the same language and style all the way through to make it very navigable. Someone should be able to jump in and go, I need to understand a bit more about how to manage content. They should be able to grab that, that content management or, um, competency and jump straight in. Let's just drill down into one of those. So if you do me the next slide. Terrific. So this is just a, 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 a fractional snapshot of one part of level 200. And you can see in here, we've pulled out some sub uh, categories. So this is collaboration. And we've thought here about governance and security within collaboration. And we've given you some examples of statements that apply for organizations or functions that are running at level 200. And then on the right hand side, what those statements or related statements might be for an organization or a process running at 400. That's a, 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 a whet your appetite for what it is. I'm going to hand over to uh, Emily now, who talks about what happens next. So as the two Simons have pointed out, we can use the maturity model to align the company on what can and will be done across the platform. 
So improve organization through the use of technology. This technology is most successful when we're using it to solve existing challenges in the organization. Maybe you're struggling with raising transparency and decision making. This could be a great opportunity to look at your communication competency and see what kind of SharePoint communication sites and news you're using. It can be used to benchmark the company and departments. The maturity model provides a rubric to measure the current state, which will be critical in measuring growth and tracking ROI to share with stakeholders or decision makers. Collaboration and communication are softer topics, so this develops the language to begin measuring it all. Microsoft 365 is so much more than usage statistics because we are essentially shifting the way people are working, collaborating, and communicating to solve these real-world problems. You can select an appropriate approach. The model acknowledges that not one size fits all. Your company size, culture, goals, and industry all have impacts on what is the right maturity level for your organization. For example, a six-person company may never need to be at the 500 level for communication. This model does not dictate any levels as better than others, but instead focuses on the impacts so you can choose what matters most to support your objectives. It helps you to develop an organizational business and technical roadmap based on what's possible, what's desired, the organization's cultures and drivers. Now that we know current state and identified future state, you can use those how-to articles that Simon referenced to navigate a plan to get there, which enables you to lead and support strategic planning with senior management. It can be used to align implementation needs and objectives. So maybe you're just be at the beginning of your journey. Your current state is level zero, so you can choose which level you want to begin with for your implementation. Some organizations might need to begin at 300 for Microsoft 365 to be impactful. Aligning on impact allows you to focus the traditional requirements conversation for Microsoft 365 on the outcome objectives, which is really about the change you are seeking and working better together. You can discuss the use of the platform with IT. It's not just about the technology. So we're expanding IT's understanding past the systems themselves to the outcome objectives it supports, which is a very user-centric focused approach. It can also be used as a socialization tool across your organization. Majority of your colleagues using Microsoft 365 aren't IT professionals and don't spend the amount of time we all do understanding the platform. So the maturity model is a Cliff's Notes version of what is possible. It's a useful artifact to share with your colleagues to increase their understanding of the platform. And even better, it is community maintained, reducing your individual burden at your organization to create this content. So as we've all alluded to, this belongs to the whole community and we would love to have you get involved. This is one of those items that is open source and not just for developers. These articles are a great opportunity for subject matter experts, business analysts, IT professionals, communications or marketing leads, truly anyone who's working with Microsoft 365. So help us grow this open source initiative by contributing in a variety of ways. You can socialize the model, ask questions, suggest changes, share experiences, look out for an upcoming Ask Me Anything with Mark, Hugo and David. And then you can actually contribute content as well. And we did call out some of those open competencies. If you want to contribute content, I highly recommend joining the Sharing is Caring training sessions by Hugo and David. There are two sessions and one is specific to community docs. As a GitHub newbie, they armed me with everything I needed to feel comfortable to contributing. Efforts like this can start in really unexpected ways. Sadie Van Buren kicked it off in 2010 with the SharePoint maturity model. Mark and I joined Sadie's efforts in June this year to update it to reflect changes in Microsoft 365. Sometimes all it takes is a tweak to get some new team members. Mark sent a tweet mid-June, which Simon Doy and Simon Hudson saw, and this initiative aligned with something they were already thinking about, so it was an excellent opportunity to begin collaborations. Just like that open loop network at your organization, Twitter is an excellent way to find new collaborators with diverse perspectives. Throughout this initiative, we have learned from each other's perspectives, gained insights into some competencies we may be less familiar with, and stretched our thinking on areas we felt we were a subject matter expert. <clears throat> Having this shared goal offered us the opportunity to develop better collaboration techniques and a connect across the globe during a time of isolation. And this has been my favorite piece as the typical networking and knowledge sharing conversations at conferences has not really been possible this year. So hopefully these benefits spark your interest in contributing to the maturity model. Thank you all for your time and attention. We hope to see your contributions and have you join this discussion with us. Thank you. This is like an amazing uh, set of content, amazing feature, I think, uh, as it, it really will help organizations assess where they are and, and plan 
to improve, to get more mature in the Micro 65 uh, usage. So really well done, great work, and hope you guys get uh, a ton of new contributions uh, and feedback uh, on this work. Well, 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 really well done. Now uh, we're at time, so I want to wrap up this call. So first of all, thanks to the, all the presenters. Uh, great content today. Uh, well done. Um, looking forward, uh, our next uh, general development cycle will be next year because uh, we have Christmas and New Year coming up. So the, the sessions on, on the 24th and the 31st are cancelled uh, due to obvious reasons. Uh, so we'll meet again on the 7th for the general dev call and for the SharePoint framework call. There is still one next week, Thursday. Uh, and as usual, all the, the video and the slides, I think kind of will become available uh, like 24 hours uh, after the call. So with that, I think we're at the very end. So here are some links for you, kind of uh, pointing to all the resources that we have. Um, and I'd like to say thank you all and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.